grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I quote here from Eusebius, an historian of the early church, in his writings concerning the martyrdom of St. James, Bishop of Jerusalem and brother of our Lord. There was a commotion among the Jews and the scribes and the Pharisees who said that there was danger that the whole people would be looking for Jesus as the Christ. They came to James and said, We entreat you, restrain the people, for they've gone astray in their opinions about Jesus as if he were the Christ. We entreat you to persuade all who have come here for the day of the Passover concerning Jesus, for we all listen to your persuasion, since we, as well as all the people, bear you testimony that you are just and show partiality to none. Take your stand, then, upon the summit of the temple, that from that elevated spot you may be clearly seen and your words may be plainly audible to all the people. To the scribes and the Pharisees' dismay, James boldly testified that Christ himself sits in heaven at the right hand of the great power and shall come on the clouds of heaven. The scribes and Pharisees then said to themselves, We have not done well in procuring this testimony to Jesus, but let us go up and throw him down that they may be afraid and not believe him. James was then thrown from the summit of the temple. Seeing that the fall did not kill him, the scribes and Pharisees then stoned him to death. The church today remembers St. James, called the just, for he was known as a noble and honorable man, the brother of Jesus, the bishop of Jerusalem, and martyr to the faith. But there was a time when James did not believe that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of the living God. Instead, the man named Jesus was nothing other than his brother and a bit of a troublemaker at that. Recall that the 12-year-old Jesus had wandered off from his family as they departed Jerusalem after the Feast of Passover. And a day after the family left, they discovered Jesus wasn't anywhere around. And now the family had to turn around had to travel back a day, and they spent three days in Jerusalem looking for Jesus. Now, can you imagine what young James must have thought? And after all that, Jesus gives what, well, what could be construed as a bit of a smart mouth reply. Why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? Well, things didn't get any easier for James and his family after Jesus began his earthly ministry because that ministry incited the scorn of the religious establishment. And Mark tells us how the scribes came down from Jerusalem to lay hold of Jesus, saying, He is possessed by Beelzebub, and by the prince of demons he casts out demons. Well, here Jesus' family tries to tries to seize Jesus. And they were giving the excuse, he is out of his mind. Now, explaining this in the best possible way, as we should, because I don't think that they, they really disrespected Jesus, but that poor guy was causing a bunch of ruckus, and he was getting into a lot of trouble. So they said, don't mind him. Jesus is crazy. It's cuckoo. I mean, don't pay attention to him. Let us just take care of him. We'll keep him quiet. We'll keep him out of the way. It's okay. Well, it was a misguided attempt by his family to save him. And it prompted from him a rather stern rebuke. Who are my brothers and sisters? 
Whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and my sister and my mother. They tried to save him, and instead they denied his work. And he said, effectively, in doing this, you are not my brothers. You are not my sisters, my mother. Because those who are doing the will of God, they are my brother and my sister and my mother. Now perhaps James was also present, as we heard this day, in the synagogue where Jesus was teaching. Perhaps he was also saying, along with the crowd, where did this man get this wisdom and these mighty works. This man in the synagogue, speaking with such authority and wisdom, well, he couldn't be my snot-nosed brother that's always causing trouble for this family. Could he? No. And the people said, Is not this the carpenter's son? And is not his mother Mary? Are not his brothers, James and Joseph and Simon and Judas? And are not all his sisters with us? Where then did this man get all these things? And they took offense at him. You see, it was not until after Christ's passion, after the beatings, the questioning, the crucifixion, his death, and finally his resurrection, that James came to faith. And James, the brother of Jesus, wasn't even one of the first ones that Jesus appeared to. He appeared to Peter and to his disciples, the twelve. And then he appeared to 500 others, in fact, more than 500. And then Jesus appeared to James. But what a powerful faith James received. He was converted and he loved God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and he loved his neighbor. Eusebius, Eusebius who writes of the martyrdom of St. James, also wrote of his great faith. He wrote that James' knees had become hard, hard like those of a camel in the consequence of his constantly bending them in worship to God and asking forgiveness of his people. St. James the Just was entrusted by the apostles with the Episcopal seat in Jerusalem made the bishop and shepherd of that holy city, that holy city from whence repentance and the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in Christ's name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. Indeed, we, we here in El Centro, California, we who I... I dare say, probably all come from Gentiles, we owe a great deal to St. James, or really to the Holy Spirit that was working in St. James. For it was the wise counsel of the Bishop of Jerusalem, James the Just, that helped to further the ministry of Saints Paul and Barnabas to the Gentiles. For without the welcoming words of St. James to the Gentiles, it is possible that the church would not even be here, physically present today. For it was by the Holy Spirit that St. James quoted the word of the Lord, delivered to the prophet Amos, After this I will return, and I will rebuild the tent of David that has fallen. I will rebuild its ruins, and I will restore it, that the remnant of mankind may seek the Lord. And all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, 
who makes these things from old. By the Holy Spirit, St. James knew that the gospel, the gospel was not meant to trouble those of the Gentiles who turned to God, but rather the gospel is the power of salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. And so St. James receives the ministry to the Gentiles. And he gives, them, he gives them instruction as is necessary as to how they should walk and live in accord with God's law and in fellowship with all Christians. And that is a hallmark of St. James. You may remember that the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther had quipped that the epistle of James is an epistle of straw. And we kind of think that that's, well, that's a put down. Say it's not, not worth as much. It's just this, this common everyday thing. But no, really, straw, while yes, common, is very useful. And it's used in almost every aspect of daily life. And so Luther, while vacillating at times between great love for the, the epistle of St. James and perhaps not caring for it so much, did understand that at its heart, the epistle of St. James is useful. It's practical. It's the epistle of straw for it has many and great uses in the daily work of our lives. And so St. James, St. James who gave practical wisdom for the Gentiles, who received them, then also moved the apostles and the elders with them to strengthen this ministry, sending forth Barsabbas and Silas to assist them. And it also seems that the Holy Spirit was foreshadowing the martyrdom of St. James, inspiring him to write at the close of his introductory section, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life which God has promised to those who love him. Recall now at the beginning how St. James found himself at the summit of the temple. He had been asked to speak to the people, to persuade the people concerning Jesus. The scribes and the Pharisees sought James because he was someone who certainly knew that Jesus was just a man. This guy was Jesus' brother, after all. Well, they didn't know or didn't seem to know, that James was Christian. And James could indeed have let them continue in their ignorance. He could have refused their request and had lived probably a, a longer life. But what kind of life would that be? Well, no life at all. For whoever seeks to preserve his life in this world will lose it in the next. Whoever loses his life in this world will keep it forever. You see, in the early church, Christians counted suffering for Christ not as a burden or a misfortune. Rather, it was a great honor and it was a blessing. A blessing because in suffering they could bear witness to the faith. Now, St. James did not seek martyrdom. The suffering sought him, and he did not turn from it. He proclaimed Christ in the heart of the holy city to all who would hear him, and even to those whose ears had become stopped. And by his witness, many were fully convinced 
and gloried in the testimony of James and said, Hosanna to the son of David. So writes Eusebius. Let us then honor his witness and the witness of all the martyrs. Let us honor the confession of our brothers and sisters, the saints in heaven who have gone to their rest before us in making our bold confession of the one true faith in the words of the Nicene Creed.